John chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 42 here this morning. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the results of this encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well. You remember the story. Jesus went by the well there at the city of Shechem. He begins conversation with this Samaritan woman. And he ends up bringing her to faith in himself. And he reveals who he is, that he is the Messiah. And she then, as we take up this story, goes in and testifies to the entire city that she is a part of. And there is an incredible spiritual awakening that takes place in this city. And so let's pick up the story here in verse 27. Notice it says there, and at this point, his disciples came because they had gone into the city to buy food. So they come back and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet not one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men. Now the word said is in the present tense. It means that she went continually saying this from every group of individuals to the next group. So she was continually saying this. Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say, there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So what takes place here is one of the most incredible city-wide revivals that, I mean, just by the testimony of just this one woman. She goes back into the city and she starts telling everybody that she can possibly tell, I met the Messiah. Could this be the Messiah that is promised to come? Now, how did she know that? Well, Jesus told her that he was the Messiah. But she questioned, she wondered whether he was the Messiah even before they even got to the end of the conversation and he revealed himself to her. So where did she get that information? Most likely from the disciples of John. So John the Baptist was declaring what? The Messiah was coming. His disciples had spread all over the area of what is known today as Israel. That is how Peter and John and James and all the disciples, that's how they got down to the Jordan River where John was baptizing. So that they were there when Jesus appeared and John baptized him. And then they made a connection. They went back into Galilee 
And then Jesus went there and called them to follow him. So there's, uh, there's lots of rumors going on throughout the nation of Israel that the Messiah has come. So that's why she questioned this fact. Then when he reveals it to her, and he's told her everything that she did, that she had five husbands, and the man she's living with is not her husband now, well, she just goes and she just became, begins to proclaim the fact that he is there, that he is present. And notice that this woman has so little spiritual truth. She has only one fact, that's it. The fact that he is the Messiah. She knows nothing else. She knows none of the other scriptures, none of the other prophecies. And an entire city flows out and believes her testimony. And look at the, look at the fruit that comes as a result of this one woman's message. Now, this, what this does, when I see this story, when I read this story again, afresh and anew this past week, I thought to myself, this woman puts me to shame. This woman puts the church to shame. This woman had no Twitter. She had no Facebook. She had no email. She had no telephone. She had none of the ways that we communicate today. And an entire city comes to Christ as a result of her one testimony. That's pretty powerful. The testimony of one individual. What was it that drove her to do this? Well, I believe it was the excitement, the joy, the zeal that comes as a result of conversion. Now, all I can say to you is, I don't think I have the same zeal that I did when I first came to Christ. I'll bet you probably most of us here don't. Which causes me to say to myself, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Awaken me. Stir me up. Because that's what I need. The fruit of the Spirit is love and what? Joy. That's what this woman had. She had joy. There was something that was transformed in her. Do you remember that joy? When you came to that conclusion, you have found the one you were looking for. That's what this woman had. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, there is a, that, that chapter speaks about repentance and what takes place in the heart of a person who repents. And one of those fruits is zeal. It's an excitement. It's a fervor that it moves and motivates a person to speak. And this is what the scripture says in Romans 12, 11. Paul says there that we are not to be lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now the word lagging means literally to delay or to be slow or to be lazy. He says, don't be lazy in diligence. And the, the Greek word there means literally zeal. He's saying, so don't be lazy concerning your zeal. And then he says here, fervent in spirit. Now that's in the present tense. It means to be continually fervent in spirit. The word fervent literally means to boil or to be hot or to be enthusiastic. It describes an excitement and an enthusiasm that is a result of what? It says it right there in the spirit, to be fervent in spirit. You see, the spirit of God is the one that brings this, this fervor and this excitement, enthusiasm. And then it goes on to say, serving the Lord. The word serving is also in the present tense. So he's saying, you need to be continually fervent and excited and enthusiastic so that you will continually serve the Lord. So this is the example that we see in Scripture of what takes place when someone is converted. And this is what we're exhorted to do and to be as a believer. Now, this excitement is what I saw in the people 
that shared the gospel with me for the first time. I was out partying one night and drinking with a buddy of mine, and we were out and saw these guys sitting at this table, and they had a whole stack of Bibles on their, on their table. And I said, hey, I know those guys. Let's go over there. Whoa, they got Bibles. Let's go talk to those Bible thumpers. And walked over, and I sat there and listened to them for the next few hours as they shared the gospel with me. Now, I knew these guys. I knew I had parted with them. They were not high. They were not drunk. They were not on anything. But I could sense an excitement inside of them. There was a joy and life inside of them. And that just made me stop and think. That's why I continued talking to them for the next several hours. Because of what I saw in them. I knew them. And so this is an excitement that I think every one of us needs in our personal life. And so I want to encourage you this morning. This is the point of, of my study today. It's, this is an excitement that you need in your life. The days are short. The time is short. And we don't have any time to waste. Are you excited and are you sharing that excitement with someone else because that's what it's all about as a believer if you've grown lazy if you've gone to that place where you're just enjoying your christian life and that's it you're you're missing the joy of life it's the result of the spirit at work this is the way the early apostles and the early disciples responded in Mark 16, verse 20. It says, they went out and preached where? Everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So they were praying for people. They were, they were ministering the gospel to people. I remember as a, a Christian just born again, I knew absolutely nothing. I was searching, looking for people I could talk to. I mean, I was looking for any hitchhiker I could pick up, and I'd get them in that car, and I'd go, where are you going? And I would go wherever they were going just so I could share the gospel with them. <laughs> and that was the excitement of conversion. Do you have that? Do you have that excitement inside? after the apostles are told and threatened that they are not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. What did they respond? How did they respond? In Acts 4.20, it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they were not going to respond to the threats. They said, I, I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to share what I know, what I've seen, what I've heard. In Acts 4, 29 through 31, what did they do when they were threatened? They prayed. They said, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the fruit of being filled with the Holy Spirit? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. I would give anything to have the Lord shake this place, this building this morning, honestly. And that we would all be filled with the Holy Spirit. If one woman can turn an entire city upside down for Christ, what could an entire church in a community do? What could the church of, across our land do if we all were excited and did exactly what these did? When they were persecuted and even put to death, in Acts chapter 4, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says there, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere hoping nobody would know who they were? No. no, preaching the word. So this is what the early apostles did. 
Now, my point is that every one of us here this morning has been given a ministry, and that ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. You say, well, Steve, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. You're called to proclaim His Word. You're pr called to be a minister of reconciliation to this world. You are saved because somebody shared the gospel with you. Will you turn and do the same thing? Will you bring somebody with you into the kingdom? Or will you stand there all alone? Or next to the side, the person that maybe led you to Christ? Will there be anybody there that will say, I am here because of you? I hope so. Because that's what he has called us to do. Do you realize that God has ordained human testimony as the primary means of how he saves people? It's the primary reason, way. If he chose to use angels, he'd send an angel to every single one of us. If he chose to reveal himself to each one of us personally that we might be saved, he would have done that. But he's chosen human testimony, human individuals to do that and to bring others to him. In Romans 10, 13 and 14, Paul says it very clearly, this very point. He says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So how is somebody going to hear and understand and, hear and know and believe? Because someone tells them. That is my point this morning. Now, one last thing before I go on to the next point in this study. I want you to note one thing that also disappeared. There was something that appeared, her fervor, her excitement, when she was converted. But something disappeared when she became converted. And you know what that was? Bigotry, racial hostility. Now, you remember, I've shared with you that the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. When Jesus reached out to this woman, she said, why are you, a Jew, talking to me, a Samaritan? They, they didn't even talk to each other. So what happens after she is converted? All racial animosity is gone. She could care less whether Jesus was a Jew or not. How does she see Jesus? Well, notice verse 29. She says, come and see a man. Just a man. He's just a man. He's not a Jewish man. He's just a man. Isn't that interesting? You see, today, I believe that this is such a critical aspect to the church. And you say, well, come on, Steve. No, nobody here believes and is racially prejudiced. Oh, I would not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that. I can say to you very clearly, I've talked to professed believers who are racially prejudiced. They make racially prejudiced statements. And I listen to them and I just, I just kind of go, how can you get that out of the gospel of Christ? Now, there's many forms of bigotry. It's not just racial bigotry. You know, there's religious bigotry. Do you know that too? If you don't go and you're not a part of our denomination or you're not a part of our church, then you're like lesser than us. And that's just as bigoted an idea. And it's, it's something that can't be. The body of Christ is men, women, of all cultures, of all backgrounds, of all ethnicities, it doesn't make any difference. If you come to Christ, it's whosoever. Whosoever will believe. And that is the way I've got to see it. They say, well, you know, 
they're, they're all alike. That, that, that racial group, they're all alike. That's bigotry, because they aren't all alike. That's like saying every one of us here is all alike, and we aren't. So what you have to do is you have to judge every person individually. That's what the Bible declares. You've got to deal with each person individually. Now you say, well, should I judge any person? Absolutely, you should. You should make judgments. There's a judgment to condemn, and there's a judgment to determine. And you have to make a judgment to determine every day. Is this someone who is a true believer? Is this somebody that I, I would count as a friend? Is this somebody I trust? You have to make those, those determinations. We're going to get to that in John 7, when Jesus said, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So we'll deal with that when we get there. So look at people individually. If you say they're all alike, you've, you've fallen into that trap. They aren't all alike. Now, next here, your testimony. This woman had a testimony, but how about your testimony? You say, well, I don't know whether I even have a testimony, Steve. I mean, I, I haven't been a bad person. And I've grown up in a Christian home all my life. And I've never done drugs. I've never, you know, used alcohol. I've never cheated, you know. I've never lied. I've never done anything. And I say to you, well, you've done it in your heart, okay? You, everybody has broken God's law in their heart. There's no good people out there. And so I may have grown up in a Christian home, and I may have followed Christ all my life, but I've broken God's law in my heart every day. So do you, every day. And it's, that's why I'm a sinner. That's why I need forgiveness every day. But you may not think you have a testimony because you've grown up in a Christian home all your life. But I tell you, I think you have a very powerful testimony. You see, you have a testimony to the keeping power of God, the power of His grace to keep you following Him all your life. Now, others of you didn't have that background. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And so you, you have gone your way. You have sown your wild oats. You have come to Christ. And both of not only those that have grown up in a Christian home and never turned away, and those that have struggled. Both of you have a powerful testimony. And the Lord wants to use that testimony to communicate with others. Now, do you know and can you share your testimony with others? I hope you can, because in a very short order, can you take in two or three paragraphs and share your testimony? That's called the short version. The long version, anybody can do, because you can just talk for hours, right? You can tell them every detail of your life. But you know what? Sometimes you never get an opportunity to give the long version. Do you know that? Now, the short version is just a couple of paragraphs. But how about the really short version? How about one sentence? Can you share your, your testimony in one sentence? You say, well, that's impossible. It's not. Because sometimes you will only have one sentence to get out of your mouth before someone cuts you off. So my testimony in one sentence would be something like this. I grew up in a non-Christian home. I was completely given over to drugs and alcohol. I met others that shared Christ with me, and I invited him into my life, and my life has never been the same since. And I want to share that person with you. So can you do that? I would encourage you, write out your testimony on a piece of paper. It really helps you to see 
what are the, what are the pertinent points? What's, what's fluff? What's too many details? Too much information? TMI? Don't, don't go down those rabbit trails. Just, just the simple facts of what, where you used to be as a Christian, as a non-Christian. What and how you got saved and what has life been like since you gave your life to Christ? Because that's your testimony. Those three aspects are critical to sharing your faith. And so I encourage you, get a, a clear, simple idea of your testimony so that you can be ready to share that with others because he's going to use it. This is the primary thing that he wants you to use. It's where you should start with people. Why, should, why do I say that? Well, in Mark 5, 19, this is what Jesus said to a, a man that he healed, and he said, and the man said, I want to go with you. But the scripture says that he didn't permit this man to go with him. He said there, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. So where does he tell us to first testify? In our home. He says, go home and tell your friends. So friends and family are your first mission field. The people you work with, those are your immediate mission field. And then branch out from there. Notice what also he says there. He says, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Now, when I started sharing the gospel with people, I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. All I could say was, I've been forgiven. He'll forgive you. He'll change your life. And you have to personally receive him into your life to do that. That's all I knew. You just tell people what the Lord has done in your life because it's your story, it's your testimony. And no one can say, oh, that really didn't happen. Because it did happen. It happened to you. That's why it is so powerful. Tell them how God has had compassion on you in your personal life because that is the reality. So share your testimony with others. Now last here is Christ's testimony to the disciples. Now notice here, he changes as, he, as he's sitting there and the disciples come up and they, they've got food to eat and the disciples, first off, are amazed that he's even talking to a woman. Notice, it says they marveled, verse 27, that he talked with a woman. Now, why does the scripture say that? Because that was the concept in those days, that women were of a lesser group and a lesser status than men. And so they are, that's the way they thought. And so they're thinking to themselves, what are you even talking to a woman for? And especially a Samaritan woman. But notice it says that the disciples didn't ask the woman, what do you seek? Nor did they reprove Jesus and say, why are you talking to this woman? They were silent. That was a good thing. That was a good choice. And so she leaves her water pot. She goes into the back into the city to testify and then they, they say, they start talking to Jesus about what has taken place. Now, isn't it interesting here that Jesus didn't think, had the same view of women that the disciples did? And aren't we glad? But that is the reason why this story is even in the gospel. It's here in chapter 4 because Jesus cares about women. And he cares about Samaritan women. He will minister to prostitutes and he will reach out to them. Why? Because he cares about them, that's why. He cares about them just as much as he cares about men. He cares about them and her just as much as he does a Pharisee. That's why chapter 3 is in the Gospel of John. He reaches out to a Pharisee. If you go on to chapter 5, he touches and heals a lame man. So he cares about people who are lame and blind and sick and diseased. That's why we have these stories in God's Word. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He doesn't just love certain individuals. He loves men and women and Pharisees and everyone, which means he loves you. He cares about you just as much. Now notice he, they asked the, Jesus this question, why aren't you hungry? Eat something, Rabbi. And he says, no. He says, I've got, I've got food to eat which you do not know, verse 32. Now what is he talking about here? Food to eat which you, which you do not know. So I wonder if you have ever eaten this food. Have I ever eaten this food? I believe I have. And I, I, I want you to question this morning, have you eaten of this food? Because this is more important to him than his, his bread, the bread that they have brought him to eat. What is this food that he declares? He said, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So he had food to eat that they had no idea of. They had never experienced partaking of this food. So have you partaken of this food? This food is that which satisfies you because it's the result of doing the will of God. That's what Jesus said. It, this satisfied him more than anything. This satisfied his soul. It brought more joy to him than eating. Now, eating is a pleasurable thing, is it not? I mean, if it wasn't pleasurable, we wouldn't eat. And so we have God's given us taste buds so that it is a pleasurable thing, so we will eat, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't do it. And if you didn't do it, you'd die. So that is why he's ordained pleasurable things. So we will partake in them. And so this, this food that he's talking about is something that is, it's more joy. It's more enjoyable. And so your life's work that you do is most likely enjoyable. Most people they have specific talents, they have specific interests, and they follow those particular interests, and they do that as their life work, which is an enjoyable thing. If I like to tinker and build things, I'll probably become a carpenter or a contractor. If I like artwork and uh, music, I'm gonna probably try and find some kind of job to do in that field. If I like computer code and math, I am going to move in another direction because it's just something that I enjoy doing. And so everybody has a life work and, and you should find joy in that. But Jesus is talking about another joy, a joy that is even more satisfying. So have you experienced that joy? Now, all I can do is give you an example of this in, in my own life. When we go out to the pier on Tuesday night and share the gospel, have most every Tuesday night, some Tuesday nights it's, it's worse. You know, if I've talked to people all day long, I'm driving down there at 6 o'clock at night, and I am exhausted. I am tired. I got a headache. I don't feel like going down there. But when I drive home, I have a totally different sense. I drive home and I'm always filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm excited. I think to myself, why was I so tired just a couple hours ago? Because there's such a joy in sharing your faith with others. Now, if you've never experienced that joy, you are missing one of the greatest foods that you can eat. It's one of the greatest things that would ever satisfy you in life is sharing your faith. You say, but Steve, I can't do that. I am, I'm the most reserved, quiet, introverted person. I, I, I just can't do that. I am just too fearful of how people are going to respond. You just don't know. And I go, I do know, because I feel that same fear. Everybody does. Some people more so than others. But the answer is the same no matter which person it is. 
Perfect love casts out all fear. And once you are filled with the love of God, which is the fruit of what? The Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. It drives that fear right out of your soul. And then it's not a burden, it's a delight. This is what David said in Psalm 40, verse 8. He said, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is written in my heart. I delight to do your will. See, that's the very same thing that Jesus is describing here to his disciples. In 1 John 5, 3, John says, For this is the love of God. Now, what comes after this, you should take note of. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So it's not a big weight. It's not some difficult thing. God's commandments should be the joy and rejoicing of your heart, the scripture says. So that is what truly the love of God is all about and what loving God is all about, being in love with him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So it's a love thing. It's not a I have to thing. So that is the key. So this is, when I share with you about sharing your testimony, if it's a have to thing, it, that's not going to flow. That's not going to happen. If it's the fruit of the joy and excitement that is in your heart, it'll flow. It'll happen. Your heart may be pounding. You may be nervous. You may sweat a little bit. But I guarantee you, you will go, I did it. And I want to continue doing this. And you have, to, you have to grow in your ability to communicate his word. Now then, notice last year, Jesus changes the whole metaphor from food to harvest. Very interesting transformation here. So he's talking about food to eat that they have no idea of. And then he starts talking about where the food comes from. It's being involved in the harvest. And so he says to them, he says, do not say, verse 35, that there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Now, what's he talking about? I bet you he's sitting there and these disciples are sitting around him and the people are flowing out of the city of Shechem and they're coming out to Jesus because the woman is in there telling them to all come out. And he turns them and he says, the harvest isn't four months away. If you're thinking I'm talking about harvest and food in the field, I'm talking about this harvest right here. Do you see him coming out here? Here's the harvest. And it's right now. And it's plenteous. So he tells them here, this harvest is now. So where you think there is no harvest... And that's the way the disciples thought, did they not? They were just stopping to get a drink of water and some food. They were moving through. They weren't going to stay in Samaria because Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans, right? So they looked at this as a non-harvest field. But it was just the opposite. Now, is this the reason why Philip in Acts chapter 8 goes back to Samaria? I'll bet you it is. He leaves Jerusalem and what's taking place there? And he goes back to Samaria and another harvest takes place. Multitudes come to Christ. You can read it in Acts 8. So do you see the harvest? Do you see the people? Do you see the lost? If you don't lift up your eyes and look, you'll never see them. I remember one day driving down the road, down the freeway, and there were all these cars, they were going the opposite direction, and I looked at all those people and I could just see their faces just as a split second, and I thought to myself, how many of these people that are going this direction are going to hell? How many of them? 
a whole lot of them. I mean, when you look at a crowd of people, anywhere from three quarters to 90% of them are going to go to hell. Does that bother you? Do you even think about that? If you can go through a day without thinking about people who are lost, you don't see. Your eyes are not open. And you need to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to open your eyes because they're all around you. And a lot of them are going to hell. Do you care? Or do you just care about going yourself? You see, that's the issue. And if you care about that, then you'll do something about it. Now, he's not only telling them to just look, but he's telling them also to pray. He doesn't say it in this context here, but he tells them in another place, in Acts, or excuse me, in Matthew 9, 35 through 38. It says, Jesus went about in all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Notice, when he saw the multitudes. If you look and you see the multitudes, it should bring compassion to your soul. And so he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. The laborers were few in that day. The laborers are still few in this day. So why does he want them to pray? Because as soon as you make that connection with him and his heart, you're going to get his heart. You're going to get an infilling of his spirit. And that's going to change you. It's going to motivate you. If we don't have an excitement for the lost to share the gospel with them, I'm telling you, we've, we've left our first love. That is really the ultimate temperature way that we take our spiritual temperature because the lost are what he cares about. That's why he came here. He said, as the Father sent me, I send you. And so that's what he has called us to do. Now the difference here, notice one last thing here, the difference between reaping and sowing. In verse 36, through 38, he talks about this difference. He who reaps gathers wages, and he who sows, uh, they're, they're two aspects to the same work. Now, this is really important because every one of us needs to realize that there is planting of seed, there's watering of seed, and there's reaping and harvesting the seed. And all of those actions and activities must take place you're not always going to reap the harvest. You sometimes have to sow the seed. There were several people that sowed the seed in my heart. And you think to yourself, nah, that guy's, it's not going to happen with him. He's not going to believe. That's probably what they thought or might have thought that. And there were people who came and shared the gospel with me after those original people. They were watering the seed until finally Billy Graham reaped the seed. You see, he reaped the harvest in my life. And so that's how it takes place. And you are going to be in one of those three activities all the time. Sowing, watering, or reaping. And you can't get discouraged when it's only planting and watering. People say, well, Steve, I've done so much planting and watering. I mean, it's just not right. Everybody else gets to reap the harvest, and I just get to water and plant. Well, that's, that's a, a very important aspect. You can't, somebody else can't reap if you don't plant. John the Baptist and John the Baptist's disciples were laboring, and now the disciples are going to reap 
their previous labor of sowing the seed because they're going to come and say the Messiah is here. And so this is an, 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 an essential aspect of your Christian life. So this morning, I just ask you, will you pray as we wait upon the Lord for in the next few moments? Will you pray and will you ask the Lord to stir you up, to stir up inside of you a desire, a passion to seek him, a passion to follow him, a passion to confess him. Will you do that? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just come to you this morning and we just acknowledge our, our desire to be stirred up. Lord, you, you and you alone are the only one who can do this stirring. Lord, you touch this woman at the well. You touch so many others. You've touched our lives. And Lord, for those of us that have just lost that fire inside to communicate your love and your truth to others, stir it up. Lord, I pray you'd teach us, help us to learn how to communicate and to testify of how you have had compassion upon us what good things you have done in our lives. Lord, help us to do that. And Lord, I pray this morning for anybody here in our midst that does not know you, is not a believer, not walking with you. If you're here this morning, you're here for a reason. Will you respond to the invitation? Will you respond to God's outstretched hand? He's saying, take it, take it by faith. You do that by just simply praying. You invite him to come in and take over your life. You just say, Lord, I am a sinner. Say that to him. If you want to receive him, say it to him. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change my life. Make me a follower of Jesus. If you just prayed that, will you acknowledge, yes, I just did pray with you. By just lifting your hand, your simple acknowledgement. Anyone here this morning? I'd like to pray for you. God bless you. Anyone else? Lord, we pray you touch this heart, touch this life. Lord, you transformed our lives. You can transform this life. There is no doubt in my mind. Do your work. Lord, we believe you to in inspire us, Lord, and to lead us, each one of us, as we share our faith with others. Lord, we believe you to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.